Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Gatehouse, here at Harlem Stage, here in Harlem, New York. Saxophonist Miguel Zenon tonight is performing selections off his critically acclaimed CD, which pays tribute to some of the most important Puerto Rican composers and songwriters. Tonight we're going to sit down and talk about why this music is very important to him and also how he was exposed to jazz music while growing up in Puerto Rico. This latest album has been getting tons of press and I think part of the reason is the fact that you've done something that most jazz musicians do. They reach out to the music of their native homeland. Yes, yes sir. Um, you know, I'm originally from Puerto Rico and uh, for many years now I've been trying to, um, just for personal reasons, but also uh, just trying to find my own personality through my music. I've been kind of delving into the music of Puerto Rico, into the traditional music, the history, the development of, of folklore down there. And uh, as I've been doing that, I've been getting more and more into the music and, and into incorporating some of those sounds into what I usually do in my own music, my own band and all that. So this, uh, this, this recording is, is an example of that. We did it before with a recording called Esta Plena, which was specifically focused on a style of music called Plena and before uh, with a recording called Hibaro, which focused on um, music from the mountains, musica Hibara. This recording is, is a little different because uh, in this case, we're not dealing specifically with folklore, but we're dealing with popular music uh, in a sense, like when people think about the American songbook and when that had its heyday, this, this music that we're playing pretty much had its heyday around the same time. So these musicians like Rafael Hernandez, Pedro Flores, etc. They are sort of the equivalent of uh, Cole Porter and George Kurzweil, the Puerto Rican equivalent of what that would be for the American songbook. How hard was it for you to dive into their music and knowing specifically what songs you wanted to bring to light? It, um, it actually wasn't that hard because a lot of the songs I, I know, I've known for a long time, either through my parents or, or just listening to them. Uh, while I was growing up, you know, this is this is not popular music from my time. It's more like music from my parents' times and even my grandparents' time. But uh, still, this music is very present in the, in Puerto Rican everyday life, as, as well as all music in general is very present in everyday life in Puerto Rico. And uh, you know, I, a lot of the songs I knew very very well from when I was a kid. I played them in school and I played them in school band and 
you know, my parents love a lot of this song, so I knew the lyrics for a long time. And I think part of it was just trying to come up with uh, with uh, with a concept that would put all this music together. And I think that eventually happened when I started, again, uh, putting it in perspective to what this meant to Puerto Rican songbook in this case. To uh, when you compare it to the Great American Songbook, how the Great American Songbook had a direct influence in what jazz music and the jazz repertoire is, and you know a lot of the songs became "quote unquote" standards, and a lot of the songs, uh, the Puerto Rican songs, are are Latin American standards also. They're known all over Latin America, and uh, you know when I did that, then I started kind of focusing on finding two songs by each composer that represented them. And each each one of these composers, of course, had his own personality, lived through a different time, and had his own specific situation that made their music sound the way it sounds. Uh, so, you know, it's not like there's uh, a Puerto Rican song style, basically. It's not like one style. They all have their own voice. But in this case, I put them all in the same batch, saying, you know, they represent... Uh, uh, a songbook, you know, putting them representing more of, a, of an essence of what the Puerto Rican song is, and in many cases, what Latin American song is, because they really transcended a lot of these composers. They transcended the fact that they were Puerto Rican. They just became sort of uh, universally Latin American in a way. <laughs> a very dear friend to this project, Guillermo Klein. I mean, I've, he's been profiled on the Pace Report and he's a dynamic composer and just how he sees and hears mu musicians play, I think that added a whole nother dynamic to this disc. Yeah, of course. You know, Guillermo um, is not only one of my closest friends, but um, I really think he's one of the greatest musical voices out there. He's one of my greatest inspirations, and I've been, I've been working with him and his band and in different configurations through the years, more than 10 years. And uh, I, um, you know, for the longest time, I was really just trying to find an opportunity for us to uh, do something together, you know, within the context of what I do in my own band. And this seemed like the perfect opportunity, not just because, uh, you know, we expanded the usual configuration that we have with the quartet with you know for a larger ensemble a 10 piece woodwind ensemble but also because Guillermo is a type of composer and I think what sets him apart from most you know composers jazz composers and recognized arrangers and orchestrators out there is that um, he's he's a songwriter first you know he's an incredible songwriter and he relates to the song to the to the you know, he relates to the micro before he relates to the biggest thing, you know. So he starts with the core of the song and then he orchestrates that. And I thought that was exactly what I had in mind. And I thought he would just find 
kind of a natural connection to the project just because these songs were so pure and it was all about the song and the lyric. And um, it really turned out perfect. You know, he related to the songs immediately even though he didn't know most of the songs and he didn't know the composers. He found um, certain connections that talked to him through the music of his own country, to tango or folklore from Argentina or the music that he knew and he was able to work with what we already had with the quartet and expand it for the, for the ensemble while still uh, you know, really put in his personality and his stamp into what we did. music in Puerto Rico. How did you segue and get acclimated to, one, the familiarity of jazz music, but two, American music, period? Well, you know, um, I started in, in, like you said, I started up in, in classical saxophone just because that's, uh, that's just a kind of natural way to start on an instrument. Uh, and I didn't really get into... Uh, into jazz music per se till my late teens, you know. Uh, but I did, I, I was very exposed to, um, to a lot of popular music from Puerto Rico, like a lot of dance music, a lot of folkloric music. So a lot of my, my first sort of professional uh, gigs as a, as a musician were playing salsa, merengue, you know, kind of dance music. So I, I had that relationship with basically making people dance in a way. Uh, and I think uh, once I discovered jazz, the thing that attracted me to me the most uh, was the uh, concept of improvisation, but not improvisation per se, because there's improvisation in a lot of different styles of music. But I felt that the improvisation, the, the, the concept of improvisation in jazz was very, very Im embedded into a, into a, a deep uh, language, you know, that uh, was so rich melodically, rhythmically, harmonically than anything that I had heard before. Uh, and, and, you know, when I first heard it, uh, that caught my eye, but also hearing somebody like Charlie Parker, for example, or John Coltrane, as a saxophone player, I was very uh, attracted to their level of facility on the instrument, you know, their technical proficiency. But then again, when I discovered that they were improvising, that was even more of a more of a shock, you know, because I was like, man, these guys are playing so incredible, and you know, everything they're playing, they're creating on the spot. So I, I, you know, it just became like an obsession to me. I just wanted to know what was going on. I had no idea about anything about jazz, but you know, I started listening slowly and getting into it, talking to friends at high school and and uh, and playing with some friends, trying to do what we could or whatever. Everything kind of learning on our own. And then eventually, once I made my way to uh, the Berkeley School of Music, that's kind of when I first got my, um, you know, my first kind of formal training in jazz. Before that, it had all been kind of just kind of learning on my own and trying to catch records here and there. But to tell you the truth, if it hadn't been for jazz, I probably wouldn't have been a musician. You know, I probably would have, would have gone a different road because that, that was kind of what... what that was the catalyst for me, you know, catalyst, because I was go I was going to a performing arts school, and you know, for music, and but I was also very interested in other things and math and science and all those, uh, like natural sciences and stuff like that. Uh, but once I discovered jazz, it just I just fell in love with it, you know, and and that that really made me, made me, you know, kind of jump in and say, okay, I'm gonna give this a try because I, I feel that 
that uh, you know, if I could make a living out of doing something that to me doesn't seem like work at all, <laughs> it would it would have just been a dream, you know. So uh, that was kind of what, what what made it happen for me. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at the Gatehouse, here at Harlem Stage, here in Harlem, New York. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Miguel Zinan for his time, as well as the staff and management here at Harlem Stage. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace. Yeah.